Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today, we're going to look at another horrific situation with you. One summer day in 2014, the New York Police Department received an unexpected phone call from a woman seeking to meet with the detective in charge of the Shell Collin case. Deborah Holmes called and demanded an urgent appointment with the investigators. Receiving such stunning news, they thought that this unexpected call might help thaw the five-year-old probe into a devastating loss. It was about the terrible death of Shelley Dana Suski, which generated a stir in Manhattan on New Year's Eve 2010. Shell Kovlin grew, raised on the west side, in an orthodox Jewish milieu. Her family's profound roots in this close-knit community affected her upbringing. Shelley's journey from a happy childhood to her successful adulthood was distinguished by her love of study and academic prowess. This thirst for information finally led her to a coveted asset management degree, which opened the door to a successful career in the Swiss banking industry. Her quick rise in the financial sphere saw her expertly handling multi-million dollar portfolios for customers. In 1998, having a prosperous career in one of the world's wealthiest cities, Shelley sensed an emptiness in her life. She enjoyed financial security and a loving family, but her ambition of starting her own family and being a mother was unfulfilled. Shelley attended a Jewish singles event in February 1998, resolved to change her destiny in order to assist people looking for a significant other. There, she met 26-year-old Rode Kovlin, a fellow banking professional. The young couple shared many common interests, both motivated by a desire for success and stability in life. Their bond was instantaneous and profound. The relationship grew quickly because they complemented each other wonderfully. Despite the significant age difference, Shelley and Rod were inseparable, sharing every moment together. They were so in love that they planned to marry soon after meeting. Despite the fact that some acquaintances thought it was a premature decision, Rod and Shelley felt like everything was exactly fine. The happy couple soon welcomed two beautiful children, a boy and a girl, to complete their family. On New Year's Eve 2009, the Kovlin family's ideal life was destroyed by a horrific tragedy that killed Shelley. Initially, the police ruled it a freak accident. At the outset of the study, they were certain it was exactly that. Early on December 31st, inside the Manhattan police station, Two officers closing up their night shift were drinking coffee and discussing their Christmas plans. However, the peaceful environment was unexpectedly shattered about 7.30 a.m. A crucial phone call. In a frenzied state, Upper West Side resident Rod, Kovlin notified Kovlin notified cops of strange happenings at his ex-wife, Shelley Danizewski's home. He discovered her dead in blood-stained water. Emergency services thought Rod could help save the victim. Following the operator's phone instructions, Rod hauled her out of the water and started Cree, but it quickly became evident that saving her life was not possible. Shelley's body remained cold and unmoving. Rod, distraught, covered her with a blanket he found in the bedroom and waited for the cops to arrive. Thus, on December 31, 2009, Manhattan witnessed a terrible incident in Rod Kovlin's life. The cops responded quickly to the situation. Upon arrival, they rapidly assessed the situation and closed off a major roadway in Manhattan. They were greeted by a luxurious home, just feet from the city park. The Upper West Side was known for its safety, and the officers initially assumed Shelley Danisiewski's death was another unfortunate case of self-injury. When they entered the flat, they discovered children's toys scattered about, which was not surprising considering the forthcoming holiday. They then went to the restroom, where the woman's body, wrapped in a blanket by her husband, lay. The bloody water in the tub and the damp floor suggested that Rod had just removed the body from the water. Shelley had a bleeding wound on the back of her head. When the cops entered the bathroom, they noticed an open cabinet door with a torn hinge, implying that the woman may have slipped and torn it off while attempting to grab onto the door. Forensic experts arrived shortly after and performed a comprehensive assessment to rule out any other potential causes of the unfortunate tragedy. After a thorough examination, they established that there was no break and no evidence of a struggle. Investigators were increasingly inclined to believe that Shelley's death was accidental. The detective working on the case chose to talk with family members. During their interrogation, it was 
found that Shelley and Rod's nine-year-old daughter was the first to find her mother's body. Despite being traumatized and astonished by what she had witnessed, the youngster was able to describe everything to the police officer. It found out that the night before, she and her younger brother had slept on their mother's bed, which is a typical occurrence. When she woke up in the middle of the night and noticed her mother's disappearance, she hurried to find her and discovered the horrible scene in the toilet. The terrified child immediately contacted her father for assistance. Rod and Shelley had recently separated and he had relocated to a new apartment on the same floor of the same building. To go to his apartment, he only needed to cross the corridor. The girl called her father, who was nearby and arrived right away. When he entered the bathroom, he removed Shelley's body from the water and dialed 911. The girl's account was exactly what Rod had stated, validating the hypothesis of an accidental death. The police notified Shelley's relatives about the tragic incident, which horrified everyone. The autopsy and forensic examination were arranged the day after the body was discovered. However, shockingly, that never occurred. When the medical examiner called the investigators to begin the examination, he was surprised to learn that despite the necessity of the procedure, it would not be performed. This perplexed the examiner, who wondered how this could happen. It came out that a rabbi from Shell's synagogue had interfered. He phoned an organization in charge of the he burial of Orthodox Jews, who then asked the police for permission to visit the disaster site for religious rites needed by the victim's family's beliefs. Permission was given, and a team, including the rabbi, arrived at the spot. They cleansed the bathtub of blood traces and prepared Shell's body for burial. All evidence and clues gathered were deleted before reaching the police's forensic department. The organization acted quickly. Since autopsies are considered taboo, in Orthodox Jewish tradition, as they are perceived as disrespecting the deceased body. In this situation, the synagogue's rabbi applied pressure to Shell's family. Grieving relatives and husband, appreciating the rabbi's assistance, and having no doubts about the incident's unintentional character, did not protest to it. The family also agreed to forgo the autopsy and delegate funeral arrangements to the burial preparation organization. Within 24 hours, Shell had been buried Hundreds of people came to pay their final respects and condolences to the family. Later, after learning from the police that relevant clues were lost when cleaning the bathroom, Shell's parents began to have concerns about the official narrative of her death. A fall in the bathtub was obviously a risk, but the possibility of death from such an accident appeared increasingly unlikely to them. Although nothing confirmed their suspicions, the possibility that their daughter's death was not an accident worried them greatly. Because the evidence was destroyed, the New York Police Department was unable to conduct any further in. Investigations causing the family to employ a private detective to clarify the circumstances and determine whether Shell's death was caused by a fatal fall. The private investigator hired by the woman's relatives began investigating this strange case by first visiting the deceased's family home to chat with them. According to their accounts, Rod and Shell's relationship was far from flawless, and their marriage was facing major issues. The couple had celebrated their 10th wedding anniversary in 2008, but soon after, their marital happiness began to unravel. Rod struggled in his career, regularly shifting professions. It was found that he had developed a gambling addiction and had spent a lot of money on it. Shelley became concerned about these behavioral changes. She was displeased with her husband's disregard of the family and excessive computer gaming. Rod was wasting their funds for backgammon tournaments, something Shella complained about to her close friends, annoyed by the amount of family money he was spending on his frequent travels. Furthermore, she realized that he had been unfaithful on his several visits. It's vital to highlight that Shelley wasn't passive or clueless about her husband's behavior. After finding his infidelity through his emails, she chose to leave their marriage and receive permission for a religious divorce. Externally, the pair still appeared to be married, although Rod had moved into another apartment in the same building. An official divorce took some time to process. Despite their estrangement and troubled relationships, Shelley and Rod attempted to maintain a cordial demeanor, particularly for their children. However, Rod's actions frequently caused confrontations and controversies. Shell had recently complained to her close friends about her husband, characterizing him as pushy and hot-tempered. She believed he was watching her, 
accessing her flat while she wasn't there and reviewing her emails. She also feared Rod had set a camera in the building's corridor to monitor when she returned home. These complications in their marriage life could have prompted more research into Shell's death. Gathering all of this information, the private detective advanced the notion that Rod was implicated in his wife's death. He needed to do additional investigations to learn the complete truth. The detective's initial task was to determine whether a crime had occurred at the location where the body was discovered. He intended to inspect Shell's residence but discovered an issue. The door was sealed. He quickly got a court order to gain entry to the location and arrived at the scene, accompanied by New York police officers. He tried to unlock the door with the key provided in advance, but the stubborn lock resisted for a while. After a few moments, Rod Kovlin emerged from his flat at the end of the corridor. He claimed to have heard noise and came to see what was going on. After being questioned by the police and the investigator, Rod took the key and effortlessly opened the door. This prompted some queries for the detective. Did Rod hear sounds in the corridor by chance, or was he deliberately keeping an eye? On things, once entering the flat, the detective was determined to discover proof to back up his murder scenario. Shell's relatives say she was home on December 31st, but her phone was missing. The detective extensively examined all rooms, but only found the woman's phone charger. The phone itself was not found. The detective was also tasked with investigating Shell's death scene, which was in the bathroom. He paid special attention to the hinge that investigators suspected she had severed during a fall. The more he inspected this object, the less he believed Shell could have pulled off the metal feature that was securely affixed to the cabinet. It would have needed enormous strength, and even given the woman's weight, there were serious questions about the possibility. Following a lengthy discussion with law enforcement, the detective attempted to persuade them that this was a homicide rather than an accident. The investigators were not persuaded and cited a lack of proof. As a result, it was decided to conduct an autopsy to definitively ascertain the cause of death. The anticipated exhumation of Shell's body aroused intense thought and disagreement among her family. More than two weeks had gone since her burial, and it was a difficult decision for her family to make. In the Jewish religion, such interventions are seen negatively, and religious leaders frequently reject them. The family needed time to make their decision. Despite the regulations, they believed it was critical to learn the truth about their daughter's death and consented to the exhumation. However, this move was hampered by more than just moral concerns. To carry out the exhumation, a special order from the prosecutor's office was needed, which was difficult to get. Despite the family's agreement, it took nearly three months. After obtaining the requisite documentation, the exhumation and autopsy were performed. The results were surprising. The test found that Shell died as a result of asphyxiation caused by forceful strangling which had damaged her neck bones. As a result, the official account of her death changed. Her death could no longer be considered an accident, and the young woman was formally identified as a murder victim. The detective's efforts and suspicions proved to be valid. The autopsy results of Shell's body were crucial, compelling the New York Police Department. To promptly resume the inquiry into her death, investigators began methodically investigating fresh details, such as phone call records and bank accounts all of which are critical in a murder inquiry. Aside from family members, everyone who interacted with Rod and Shelley was questioned, including the babysitter, housekeeper, and even the divorce lawyer. The lawyer told the police about the couple's unusual behavior. Rod stated at the first divorce hearing in May 2009 that he was unable to pay alimony owing to unemployment. The judge playfully recommended that Rod give up his favorite games which enraged him in court and exposed his true personality to everyone. Rod did not stop there. He sought vengeance on Shell, accusing her of living in a moral lifestyle, wasting finances, and even calling her workplace with malicious allegations about drugs and violence against their kid. Shelley suffered greatly as a result of these false charges. An investigation launched in response to these allegations revealed no evidence to back up her husband's assertions. The most shocking component of this incident, however, was when Rod and Shell's son confessed that his father had instructed him to speak things designed to undermine his mother. 
Rod paid a high price for his despicable conduct. At a fresh divorce court on July 7, 2009, he was barred from being alone with his children, a measure that stayed in effect even after Shelley's death. Rod was denied custody of his children, and a social worker turned them over to Rod's parents, igniting his fury. He most likely imagined he would finally accept responsibility for his children. Police also interviewed a woman who had previously cared for Rod's children before being let go by him. She presented the detectives with intriguing information. It turns out that on December 30th, Shelley had a costly carotene hair treatment worth several hundred dollars. After treatment advice included avoiding moisture and heat exposure for several days, which precluded bathing or showering, this prompted an inquiry. Why would Shelley risk causing damage to her hair by disregarding these recommendations? Investigators speculated that Shelley did not take a bath on the day she died. However, their judgments lacked concrete proof and were inadequate to charge anyone with murder on their own. Detectives also looked at CCTV footage from the building where the couple lived. On the day of the murder, they noted Rod's unusual conduct. The night watchman at the building's entry who was quizzed considered Rod's early morning departure peculiar because he had never left so early before. The watchman remembers Rod asking if he needed anything, to which he said no. However, Rod returned a few minutes later with chocolate bars and offered them to him. The detectives concluded Rod's actions were purposeful in order to provide an alibi for himself. Rod was now the major suspect and the investigators were tasked with proving his guilt through any means necessary. Their major question was, what drove Rod murder his wife? Despite two divorce hearings, Shelley and Rod remained legally married throughout the inquiry, which meant that without a will or divorce, the property would automatically go to Rod. It amounted to more than $5 million. Another critical element was that on December 31, 2009, Shelley scheduled an appointment with her lawyer to amend her will, aiming to exclude her husband. This was obviously a blow to Rod, providing a motivation for the murder. Rod's potential loss of $5 million was clearly a motivating factor. Because he was already a suspect, all of Shelley's assets were moved to a secure account pending additional evidence of his involvement in the crime. It was obvious that if Rod had been monitoring his wife, he would have known about her meeting with the lawyer to remove him from the will. Investigators suspected Rod of using malware to track his wife. Shelley was also seen returning home at 8 p.m. on surveillance tape. The night before, talking on the phone, which was never recovered after the crime, they now knew for certain that the phone was in the apartment. They decided to undertake another search at the crime scene. When the investigators returned to the flat, they didn't have to search long. They couldn't believe their eyes when they spotted Shell's phone gently laying on her bedside table, plugged into the charger. Neither the New York Police Department's first search nor the private detective's inspection revealed the device in this place. Furthermore, during previous searches, investigators photographed the area, but the phone was not on the bedside table. There was only one explanation. Rod had returned the mobile phone to Shell's walled flat. It was unclear whether this was a naive mistake or a planned challenge to the investigators. Rod was summoned in for questioning, but he had already retained a lawyer who urged him to remain silent. The detectives had to hunt for more evidence of his involvement. When authorities examined Rod's phone records, they discovered repeated calls to a number registered in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Deborah Holmes, a married mother of three, owned the phone number. She was 14 years older than Rod. They had met in a backgammon tournament five months before Shell's death and had a passionate relationship. The lovers met at backgammon tournaments or while playing together online. The investigators recognized an opportunity to get a lead and called the woman to ask her a few questions. To their surprise, Deborah said that her lawyer had told her not to speak with them. Faced with another rejection, law enforcement personnel began to inquire about the attorney's name. It turned out to be the same lawyer who represented Rod Kovlin. The police's last hope was to unearth compromising letters or electronic correspondence between Rod and Deborah. They hoped to find these on Shelley's recently recovered phone. Unfortunately, every message had been professionally removed. Even competent programmers were unable to recover the data. Rod had painstakingly arranged everything, apparently mocking the authorities. 
Days stretched into months and years, and it was clear that Rod Kovlin was avoiding justice. Perhaps the crime he committed was ideal, but the rabbi's cleansing of the bathroom, which removed all traces of blood and other evidence, was vital. This action destroyed all potential DNA, fingerprints and fibers complicating the investigation, which became increasingly drawn out. Rod never admitted to his wrongdoing, and a lack of evidence stopped the case from proceeding to trial. Five years had gone since the inquiry into Shelley's death began, and no arrests had been made. After years of fruitless searches, for hints and proof linking Rod Kovlin to his wife's death, the suspect's mistress unexpectedly stepped forward. After her phone call, the police invited her to the station. Deborah Holmes entered instantly and found out that she and Rod had split up a few months before, causing her to call the police. What she told the detectives over the next three days astonished them. Deborah had a lot to reveal. She informed them of Rod's plans for custody of his children. Rod was still a suspect in his wife's death and had no custody rights over the children, so he couldn't access her money. Rod was willing to do everything to see Shelley's millions and had devised a heinous plan. Kovlin intended to persuade his 15-year-old daughter to stage an assault, then accuse his father, Rod's father, of the crime. This would throw the grandfather in jail, resulting in his losing custody of his grandkids. Rod thought his daughter would accept his proposal in exchange for money. Meanwhile, the criminal was constantly taking money from the only account he had accessed. The one where Shelley had deposited monies for their children's education. Brad's parents saw he was squandering his savings, which should have gone towards his daughter and son's future. They were dissatisfied with his lack of involvement in his children's lives, which sparked a disagreement. Rod was so unhappy with his parents that he seriously considered terminating their life. Rod Kovlin shared his plan with Deborah in 2012. He intended to have his daughter add rat poison to her grandparents' tea. Because the girl was a kid, Rod calculated that she would spend far less time in prison than he would spend far less time in prison than he would. Deborah persuaded her lover to reject his terrible intentions. Following this, Rod had several further ideas. At one point, he considered burning down his parents' house and jamming the doors to keep them inside. He even pondered arranging a phony marriage for his daughter with a Mexican man, after which she would be required to give up a portion of her wealth to her father. When the police heard Deborah's testimony, they couldn't believe the accuracy of the details. She had been gathering evidence and storing it on hard drives all along. Knowing she was dealing with a psychopath, she patiently waited for Rod to lose interest in her before providing these crucial insights to the detectives. The recordings included hundreds, if not thousands, of Rod's discussions with various persons. Now, law enforcement personnel had to carefully listen to these gigabytes of data in quest of compelling proof. Dever's contributions to this intricate inquiry were substantial. As detectives began to examine the recordings, they discovered something surprising. In a conversation with a backgammon friend, Rod accidentally stated having keys to Shelley's apartment and the ability to enter it at any moment. These hard disks proved to be a valuable resource for the police, including hundreds of case-related data. Investigators discovered Rod was conspiring against his own daughter, intending to blame her for the mother's death. According to an email address used by the father to forge an email, the daughter acknowledged to lying and that her mother did not fall. According to the invented account, they had a fight in the evening and she shoved her mother into the bathroom. Thanks to all of the information obtained, the authorities ultimately had enough evidence to charge Rod Kovlin with his wife's death. On November 1, 2015, Rod Kovlin was arrested. Shelley's family awaited the trial of their daughter's offender, but triumph was not certain. The charges were circumstantial, and a smart attorney might raise doubts in the jurors' minds. The detectives continued their investigation, obtaining new information and thoroughly checking all evidence. Soon, irrefutable proof came from an unexpected source. While in prison, Rod Kovlin told a fellow inmate of his wife's death. He explained his actions in great detail, even replicating the gesture he used to strangle her. The cops requested CTV footage and discovered that it perfectly matched the autopsy results. This was concrete evidence of Rod's culpability, almost like a confession. The trial lasted seven grueling weeks. 
During this time, the jury heard Kovlin's terrible schemes, which included murdering his wife, targeting his parents, and framing his own children. The jurors was outraged by his cold-blooded and dishonest behavior. It took them two days to reach a final decision. Rod Kovlin was found guilty in March 2019 of the deaths of Shelley Denisewski, his wife, and his children's mother. Despite the lack of concrete proof, he was sentenced to life in jail with the chance of parole after 25 years. Shelley Kovlin was a successful and strong woman who pursued basic family happiness. However, a merciless, greedy monster crossed her path, claiming not just her life, but also that of her children and loved ones. Deborah Holmes' determination helped bring justice to this heartbreaking incident. The culprit was punished for his heinous acts. Deborah's bravery most certainly aided, not only in obtaining justice, but also in averting potential future crimes. Rod Kovlin will never again damage his family or the people of New York. Thank you for watching, guys. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell to not miss out on fresh stories from around the world. See you soon, and take care.